so hey, this is Robin Matos from TechW, and I'm here uh, joined remotely, of course, as per usual, by Herman Norilla. He's the co-founder and CEO of a company in the UK called Improbable. Uh, now, we have a lot of ground to cover uh, because the company has been around for 10 years. It's one of these uh, well-known UK tech companies uh, moving in a very, very uh, interesting space, uh, but also had some recent news uh, to announce. So we have a lot to unpack. But first of all, Herman, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much for having me. I think we've been trying to connect for a while, so it's great to finally do it. Yeah, yeah, great on our side as well. Uh, we are restarting the To The Point video series here at TechEU, uh, where we interview some leading entrepreneurs and investors uh, from across Europe uh, to talk more about their business and their future plans. Uh, so we'll dive right in. Uh, as I said, we have a lot of ground to cover. Other side, first trip, Yuga Labs. Uh, but let's start with the, the beginning, which is improbable, which has been around for about a decade now. So uh, maybe you can take us back to the to the early days. and, and, and... Sure. So, you know, like the, the sort of holy grail problem in the metaverse is how do you actually make the experiences good? Right. I mean, that's the unspoken problem that, you know, everybody has been focused on. How do we enable the fantasy of stadiums full of people interacting in virtual worlds or the ready player one vision of massive battles and when we started improbable you know there wasn't really the word metaverse wasn't really being bandied around but we were obsessed with online games and we wanted online games to become richer and more meaningful and we wanted the experiences that we'd read about in books or imagined in fantasy to actually be games because you know at that time and still to a large extent right now online games are very simple you know, these are very static environments where people are interacting, maybe in small groups of 10, 20, 100 people and are generally unable to engage in really rich, really detailed, really interesting gameplay of the type that you might have, have imagined. And so Improbable set out to solve the very hard computer science problems in making that happen. And it's taken us generation after generation after generation of technology to get there. In fact, the problem was so challenging that along the way, we found applications in areas like defense, which have now become uh, quite fruitful in their own right. So it's been a journey to get to the point where we can do some of the things that, uh, that I think now we've demonstrated publicly in the last few weeks. And, and does that mean that the technology around you has evolved to a point where you can make that happen? Or is it you that's been pushing this technology forward? It's both. I mean, um, when we started the company, the cloud even as a, as a resource, which was widely available, efficient, cheap, and with access to hardware that could support some of what we wanted to do, wasn't quite there. Things like game streaming, which are not essential to what we do, but a very useful complement weren't there. Even just the market, right? I mean, we're in a place now where crypto and NFTs, and which are so important for the monetization of, of the metaverse, uh, you know, now really exist. When we started the company, they were, they were very much in their infancy. Um, so it's been a combination of that. And then also breakthroughs on our side. Like, you know, we took about three years, four years to get to the point where we could handle a million communication operations a second. And this is like the key metric of the metaverse. Uh, for reference, a game like Fortnite does about 10,000. And then it took us subsequent time to get to where we are now, which is to a billion operations a second. So each order of magnitude increase in complexity has involved new techniques. I mean, we, we now use machine learning techniques for bandwidth compression that weren't around when we started the company. So a lot of this stuff um, you know, has been quite recent. Fantastic. Um, so maybe take us back uh, again to the early days of the company because you, you were a fan of online games. Uh, you wanted to have a richer experience, so you started building this technology on your own. Uh, what were some of the early challenges that you had to overcome um, to get to a point where you felt comfortable enough to say, OK, this is actually going to be a sustainable business or a really big business? I mean, to be honest, we were kind of idiots when we started. This company. <laughs> I, mean, I think Rob, me and the others would agree. We, we were all I mean, we were all computer scientists. We all graduated out of Cambridge. We thought we could solve any problem, do anything. Um, I think the hardest thing has been accumulating a team of people who combine the deep, specific insight on how to build really amazing online games. I mean, we have people now who have built games, you know, who've led games like uh, League of Legends or, or, you know, contributed to major titles like Fortnite. And to combine that with computer scientists and engineers who'd built, you know, 100 million user, billion user scale systems at the big tech companies. So to actually build a culture that could fuse those two groups of people and to really understand and break down the problems was hard. The other really challenging thing is that it isn't like there's like one trick and then you're there. You have to continuously harden, reinforce, test and build infrastructure. And you have to learn how to create tools that people can actually use. Our early technology was very hard to use. We imposed upon people a programming language they didn't like. We made it necessary for them to learn techniques that they weren't interested in learning. It took us a long time to get to the place where we can make simple experiences on top. I mean, just as, as one example, 
testing our system has been a nightmare from the beginning. How do you test something that can handle 15,000 players? It actually costs about $100,000 to hire 15,000 people to show up and do something. So are you going to spend $100,000 every single time you test? Well, well, clearly not. I mean, we do spend a lot on human testers, but we've ended up building our own infrastructure to create thousands of fake machines in the cloud, which, regu- which basically simulate the load of actual players connect in just like players will, and then use AI to run around the world in order to try to break the system. So these types of tools have taken a long time to come together. I can imagine. And uh, you mentioned that you sort of um, started with online games, but then diversified into other markets. Uh, where, at what point did this sort of epiphany come, you know, where this technology can actually be used for other purposes that might also be, you know, contribu- contributing well, to actually, business? Um, so although Improbable's metaverse efforts are what's in the news now and what, we, what we're largely talking about and, and, and the vast uh, bulk of our revenue now as well, um, we've had huge success in applying not just our technology, but also new tech unrelated to the metaverse in simulation, modeling, AI, and accuracy. And we're now actually in active operational use in the UK government um, in supporting the simulation of uh, conflict zones, cyber resilience, all sorts of problems. And that's likely going to spin out as its own business. Um, We're going to talk about it more publicly, and even if it's just spinning out in the way we talk about it, because we've kept it quite secret um, within Improbable. Um, But it's been really fortunate to have this other offshoot that is now also generating uh, a lot of value for the world and quite exciting for us as a company to think that we're we're solving problems that entertain people, but we're also solving problems that hopefully help keep people safe as well. Um, And it's 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 been pretty accidental to have done that as well, not something we intended but it sort of came about. Yeah, nice coincidence. Um, I, uh, when I read about, uh, about Improbable now, it's positioned as a metaverse technology company. Arguably, it's always been a metaverse technology company, um, but as you pointed out, the name metaverse didn't really, you know, it wasn't at least not mainstream or as mainstream as this today. Um, but does it also mean that you sort of, I, I wouldn't call it a pivot, but has the, the initial focus of the company changed over time, and especially in the last two or three years, when the metaphors is as basically yeah, yeah I'd, say, I'd say probably the most surprising change is that despite you know we're the largest provider of sort of multiplayer expertise and services to the games industry so we support about 60 different publishers we've we're an eight out of ten top western games and that's a services business you know we provide our expertise so we built um games like uh, the back end of fall guys which became a really big hit other titles you might think hey once we've built this metaverse technology the place we would apply it would be all of those customers I think the surprising thing has been, no, it's not them. It's actually sport, music, fashion, Web3. It's companies that have large-scale communities and celebrity and event-based um, business models that are much, much more compelling for what we've created. Because very large numbers of users and high-density environments, they have an immediate impact in those spaces. I'll just give you an example. You know, Think of sport. Um, how many Manchester United fans are in Southeast Asia? How many of them have ever been to a game? You know, what if we could put them all into a stadium where they could talk with everybody else in real time, interact with the celebrity, be in that environment? So there's some much more obvious use cases that are outside of it. I think the other very interesting pivot, um, or at least uh, change in, in, in how we thought things would play out, is the business model. Uh, you know, we were in the business initially of, um, you know, selling technology. And I think what's happened now with the M Squared network is we're actually building more of a platform where our customers and partners are choosing to integrate with each other's content. So I think what isn't very publicly known is, you know, with the other side, um, the Yuga Labs team have, have made the really forward-looking decision to be part of the M-squared network, which means you can take your avatar from one world to another. You can actually combine content from different worlds together, and we handle that technically. That's not something the games industry wants, really. Uh, you know, they're, very, they're much more protective and insular over their content. And I think in, in culture and in Web3, there's a lot more of a feeling of openness. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's maybe take a step back, but then, because that was the, the recent news item, uh, uh, which we connected about in the first place. Um, other side, um, by Yuga Labs, of course, well known for the, the Board Ape uh, Yacht Club uh, NFT project. Uh, what are they doing exactly? Uh, where are they now? And how is Improbable involved in all of this? Sure. So um, other side is the game developer of other side. So we have a Improbable is the game developer of other side. So we have a full studio, which is actually building other side. That's that's what we do. On top of that, um, other side utilizes our technology, Morpheus, and is part of the M-squared network. So we're kind of the construction company that is helping Yuga Labs to realize their vision and their ambition. And a joint creative team between both companies works together to manifest uh, the world and and, and what it is. And what what we're doing for them is 
really turning other side, I think, into the most sophisticated metaverse ever. Um, you know, we so showed on Saturday 4,500 people in a dense virtual location, speaking all at once with their own voices, interacting with live actors, and all of that on a browser with a click link button to jump in. And I think that, you know, that's that's a step up from what we've seen in this space before, which I think has been big on ambition, but limited on delivery. Yeah, I've seen some of the footage and also the commentary from people who participated. Uh, it sounds like it was a real, uh, real experience indeed. Um, it sounds like a clo close collaboration as well. Uh, how did it come about in the first place? So um, an amazing individual, Guy Osiri, who sits on the board of Yuga Labs and is a sort of Hollywood. Um, oh, was he the, the manager of Madonna before? Yeah, he is. He's this amazing. Him, yeah. Yeah. He knows everybody. He's a, he's a wonderful guy and, and very forward looking. And he, he met us when we were um, demonstrating the Morpheus technology to a number of partners. And he said, you know, you guys should meet the Yuga Labs people. And then when we got talking to Yuga, we met people like Gordon and Nicole and others they immediately click with us and we both had a very similar ambition. And I think that's led to a very fruitful collaboration. You know, this, the, the product that we're producing here is very much a fusion of, of kind of our mutual creativity and the technology and their community. Their community is amazing. You know, the people who connected in, you know, it's, it's stunning. I think they, I think if you think about how much land and, and NFT assets have been sold already in other side, it already makes it a very successful game. Yeah, and I'm guessing it also makes for an interesting use case to take to other uh, types of NFT projects or, or other entertainment companies for that matter. A hundred percent, you know, and we'll be announcing more partnerships uh, later in the year. But I think if we get this right, we can build a network where all of these companies make each other more successful, where content can move freely between them, where users can feel confident that they're going to have a high quality experience. And I think what we're doing with the M2 network in providing services that go beyond just the gameplay side. So we're also providing payment elements. We're also providing... Um, you know, virtual object interoperability standards. These things we're wrapping and making easier. We're working with other providers to do this as well. So I think collectively, that's going to make this kind of a, a great offering for anybody looking to create metaverse content and very much in opposition or contrast to some of the other metaverse uh, opportunities that are out there. Yeah, great. Um, can you maybe walk us through, because it's been less than two weeks when uh, Yuga Labs, of course, uh, sort of open up other side for, for a select few um, of their, their community. Uh, for the first time, I think it was, they, they call it the first trip. Um, how did it go? Did everything go according to plan? Uh, what were some of the learnings uh, from that? I mean, it was, it was a dream, you know, it couldn't have gone better. We had, I think 99% uh, of users had, had a flawless technical experience. We had a couple of glitches that we were able, we did the test in order to undo, but all in all, it was brilliant. We were surprised by some of the things that were fun. Uh, you know, we had a live actor playing uh, Curtis, the, uh, the ape in the context of the event. And, the back and forth reaction with the crowd in a live actor, that's something you never see in video games, right? And it completely changes the emotional resonance of the event. It feels like, were you there? Did you see it? Was it part of, you know, were you there? Whereas if you look at something like the Travis Scott concert in Fortnite or those types of things, they're great experiences. And, and Epic is an amazing company and those experiences are wonderful, but they're very different. They're more like music videos. You know, you're not having a live interaction with the artist and you're not in a large crowd. You're in your own siloed experience, which is fun, but takes away from the meaning of the event. Yeah, so you basically go from consuming rather, rather than rather consuming than rather participating than consuming only, uh, I guess. Exactly. Is the... and, and I'd say, look, a lot of people like, you know, uh, thinkers like Matthew Ball and others have written that the metaverse is an extension of the internet or an extension of entertainment experiences. I just don't agree with that. I don't think that's what the metaverse is at all. I think the metaverse is really the next evolution in our culture. And the important part of it is that it represents a network of events, objects, people, and things that actually create value in the real world as much as in the virtual world. I look at sport, for example, as a great example of a proto metaverse, right? Like it, it doesn't matter who wins the World Cup on some level, but it really matters on another level, right? It affects geopolitics even on some level, because as human beings, we've imbued this other world with meaning. We've given it a sense of importance. And that requires us, if we want to do that in the digital world, to create these really important, meaningful, interesting networks of interaction. And that's where our focus is as improbable. You know, we don't, we don't see the metaverse as being about video games. We think video games are a cool thing you'll do in the metaverse, but the, video, the metaverse is really about culture. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about games, uh, sports, movies, etc. cetera. Uh, this is mostly consumer stuff. Is there also a place for business and corporate environments uh, for this metaverse technology? I think so. I think, um, you know, we conduct our town halls inside the metaverse every week. And so we have thousands of uh, people, um, well, and probably we're a little under a thousand now, and we, we sometimes invite other people. But we, we bring everybody into a space where we do a town hall, where people can see on a big screen uh, what's happening. I can be there. Other people can be there. We can talk to the crowd and we can spend time together. And as a virtual company, 
it's pretty amazing to have everybody in one place. It gives you, it's not, it's not a replacement for in-person interaction. It's a pr profound enhancement to digital interaction. You know, Zoom is great if it's five of you talking, but it's not a great place to have a, a crowd of people interacting. No, absolutely not. Um, so, so let's talk about more about technology. When you started a company about 10 years ago, um, technology has evolved uh, quite a bit since then. Uh, but what still needs to happen to sort of get to the point where you're really, really comfortable with the technology, whether it's built in-house or, or around yeah. you? Being able to handle literally a billion communication messages a second efficiently and cheaply today means that there's no use case that we've talked about in this conversation, stadiums, music, concerts, whatever, that we, that we don't feel we can compellingly handle today. Um, but what's missing is not the scale technology. It's all of the other infrastructure. It's ensuring that there's good formats for interoperable virtual objects. There's good services to, to help run and manage these metaverses. So that's really where we're turning our attention now. We are pushing scale still. We'd like to get to 100,000 people, which would be really cool, but, but, um, but you know, kind of a, a next step challenge in terms of scale. But really our focus now is services because I think there's a misperception that the metaverse will be consumed the way video games are consumed through a storefront, you know, where maybe you'll go on Steam or an Ep on the Epic Game Store. We don't see it that way at all. We think the metaverse is about events and moments and those need to be shared through links on social media or need to look and feel more like a connection to the standard internet in its kind of much more decentralized fashion. There's also a lot of work to be done on the crypto side. You know, um, if everybody in other side were to do a crypto transaction simultaneously, that would crash most blockchains, right? There is, there is no scale there yet. Although with the ETH merge and with other improvements in side chains, there definitely is technology moving in the direction of, of, of making this more possible. So the blockchain side of things, I think, is, is really fundamental. And that's why I'm a little bit disappointed that so many games companies are turning their back on it because they're missing the opportunity that it presents. Yeah, yeah, yeah makes sense. And as a business, uh, because you've, you've picked up a couple of hundred millions of funding uh, in pounds uh, along the way, you've raised on another 150 million for M squared, I think earlier this year. Um, what's next for you as a business? Can you make this sustainable enough to do a long-term company? We probably already are sustainable. Um, obviously, we, we, it's not a discussion where I can kind of go into financials, but um, we've found that this direction of serving customers in the way that we do is much more lucrative than I think we anticipated. Um, there's a lot of demand for what we do. We don't need necessarily to, um, to operate in an unsustainable or unprofitable way. I mean, there's still a way to go. We're not quite there yet, but we now see a clear path to, to basically being a, a profitable, fast-growing company. And we've been really excited by the the level of um, enthusiasm the market has had for this capability. You know, it's taken us a, a while to get here, but now that we've broken through, it feels like the trajectory is quite fast. But obviously, you know, fingers crossed, who, who knows? And the economy more widely is, uh, is, is hardly doing anyone any favors today. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, is that demand coming mostly from, from Western countries, US, Europe, or is it also coming from Asia, Africa? And, uh, it's and it's all over the world, but at yeah. the moment, we're very focused on the West, uh, mo mostly because of availability and servers, regions, infrastructure. But I do see us uh, also quite interested in Asia as well. And, and what's your biggest challenge as a business today? Because you mentioned earlier, hiring in the beginning, you know, the right type of uh, experienced people was a challenge. Is it still that way? or? I think communication at the moment. You know, We're quite a confusing company. We, we do a lot of different things. We are um, behind the scenes helping a lot of other people. We've not been very prominent and out there. And now we need to really get the message out because we'd like to start attracting even more talent who are really passionate about this problem and who can work well with us. Also execution, you know, we have a lot to prove with things like other side. It's great that we had a successful test, but that's just a test. There's a long way to go to build a really great compelling world. And as anyone who's followed our history knows, you know, it's really hard to build and launch and make successful online games. Uh, we've been really proud to be part of a lot of titles. Um, you know, I think we've, I don't know, more than 10 titles or something like that that, that, have, that have launched based on tech that we've supported. Um, but commercial success is tough. You know, it, a lot is a lot to prove for a given game uh, beyond just the technology working well. Yeah. And, and what does the competitive landscape look like? Is anyone else out there doing uh, you know, similar things to you? There's a lot of talk of like a race to the metaverse and people often ask me like, you know, aren't you afraid that this company or that company, Facebook or Microsoft or whatever would, I actually look at it a little bit differently. Everyone's running a different race right now. You know, Facebook is off doing the long jump trying to make, you know, VR headsets. Microsoft is chasing an enterprise metaverse. Epic is focused on an engine centric, you know, metaverse. I think this market is so nascent that it's almost not even worth talking about competition right now. You know, it's, it's too early to even really know or understand what represents the most important areas of value within this network. So it's very collaborative right now. I think, I think a lot of companies are helping each other out. You know, it's, it's important to create value for everyone and grow the pie. We're not at the sort of 
win a takes all stage of this market yet. And I think there's a danger in applying false historical analogies, like with the iPhone and Apple. I think that confuses people into believing that you're going to see a single vertically integrated super metaverse company. It's hard for me to imagine how that would come about or why that would be in anyone's interest. Great. Uh, slightly different topic. How much do you feel part of the UK tech ecosystem? Wow. It's, uh, well, we're very much a proud UK company. I mean, we help the UK government in a lot of different contexts. But I think after COVID, everything's changed. Uh, there's a lot of talk now about, oh, is this city or that city going to be a tech capital? It, it doesn't matter anymore. Everybody wants to work from home. That, that's the, that's, if I had one sort of like message to other like entrepreneurs, and I think they would echo it back to me, it would be none of our new hires want to work in the office. And if we force them to do it, they just will go to companies that, that will. And that means that the notion of a scene has broken down into something much more decentralized. You also see this with the top sort of executive and leadership layer, venture funds, and recent, recently announced they no longer have an office. Uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's going to be this globalization, a massive globalization of tech talent, tech funding. So, you know, for the M squared round, which happened, you know, a little bit during COVID, I didn't meet a single person in person. You know, I, I didn't have a single meeting in person. And we raised $150 million from 26 different investors, right? So, and I've heard of other founders too, who've, who've done big rounds now without ever meeting. So I suspect we're going to see this, this, this kind of end of, are you a UK tech company or an American tech company? I, I think we're going to start to see a very different view of things. Well, that sounds like a very good environment uh, to be a metaverse technology oh, company. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you feel like the, the next 10 years are going to be as exciting as the first 10? I think the first 10 was a, a difficult journey to get to the point where we can enjoy the fruits of what we've now created. It was very emotional to see all of this stuff working well. So yeah, I think the next 10, I think the next 10 are really what we've been waiting for. We were quite early as a company. We probably were too early. We started building much sooner than the market was ready or that the technology could support our larger ambitions. And now it feels like the timing is kind of a little bit perfect. Um, you know, while obviously the current crypto downturn and other things are challenging, they're also an opportunity. You know, it's when it's when the exuberance of bubbles end that well-capitalized, well-positioned companies with real revenue, I think, can capture a lot more market share. So I think there'll be some pretty big winners that emerge from this network. And I hope our customers are among, among those winners. Yeah. Well, it was great to uh, to catch up with you. It was great to see the, the first sort of implementation of other side. I'm sure that there's lots more uh, uh, partnership announcements uh, on the way. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye out, of course. Herman, thank you so much for your time. And thank you for having me. And best of luck with Improbable. Thank you.